is our review session for the midterm. We will discuss anything we've discussed thus far in terms of the coverage. Uh, why don't I wait for a minute to let, let you pose any, any questions. If you don't have so many specific questions, I can talk about the five sections of the course that we've covered so far and some points there, but you can you more or less, you've heard me say most of the specifics. You may have read something, and the syllabus gives you some keywords and, and bigger keywords. But why don't we start for, for a minute first and just to see what kind of questions we get. Maybe, maybe let two, three, four people pose some questions, unless there's, there's something very quick I can answer immediately. So, questions. How can we be helpful? or suggestion, that is, does someone want to suggest that I give you a quick overview of some of the five sections? That is, I can do a, a little mini comment on that, if that would be helpful, or is that redundant? I don't want to do that if you redundant. Yeah? Uh, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, how, many, how many agree with? Okay. All right. So let, let me do that as a, as a start, and then we can, we can go from there. <coughs> okay. The first half of the course, basically, or first part is, is, uh, <coughs> is an overview of the urban field divided into five parts. Um, and in a sense, the, the five sections come together in a more integrated manner as we laid out in the last year near the end with filling in more specific. So if what we're studying here is urban policy, these can be budgets, money, jobs, contracts. These can be a smile, one smile by the mayor, or a smile if we don't just say, and, well, okay, smile, can, they can be abstract and symbolic, they can be material, uh, they can be mostly narrowly governmental, or they can be statements about capitalism, racism is what we should be fighting, and in this city, let's do this, to symbolically attack the capitalist world around us. That's a, that, that is an urban policy that's stated as a, and there, for instance, there are communist cities in Italy which would, which would put up uh, signs for no nuclear as you come into the town, which was a, which was a, a symbol of, of that kind of commitment. Then there was a communist town I knew, I visited, I, I, I kept in touch with. <laughs> um, and when, they, when the communists lost power, they then crossed out part of that and they, and they redrew the old communist symbol. That, so basically, the symbolism of coming into the town and how it gets labeled is an urban policy in that sense. Uh, that is, it, it may be one group that then tries to change it, but if the government comes back and tries to erase the, the, uh, the signage, the, uh, the, the efforts to redefine, these are, these are all, in, in Chicago, for instance, mo most, many cities in Western Europe and, and, and New York, let's say, many parts of LA are covered with graffiti on the walls. And in Mexico, it's, a, it's more of a finer, it's a finer art. In Chicago, the Mayor Daly created what they call graffiti blasters. We, the city of Chicago does not sell the paint that, it, that is ideal for making graffiti. You, can't, you couldn't buy it for decades. And then the mayor would send out a team of graffiti blasters who would erase graffiti every week. That, these are visible urban policies that differentiate places. Okay. So <laughs> that's the dependent variable which we're focusing on. But then as we started to fill in some of these like leadership and then more, we also pointed out that we can have feedback from the fact, for instance, if the mayor is not selling graffiti blasters, I'm going to go to Indiana or somewhere and bring, bring, bring back a truckload of these and give them to my friends because we want to have graffiti in Chicago. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, 
leadership box, first of the five, basically says leadership may matter. Like, like a Mayor Daly whose style uh, uh, was, was used in, a, uh, for instance, in a one hour documentary that I saw when the city of London, England was discussing, should we have a stronger or a weaker mayor and a legal structure of, for greater London or should we have lots of little Lots of little governments, little little mayors within the city of London, and, they, and they've gone back and forth. So it, London is not as strong as Chicago, but the but the fact is the style. Then some, let's say, 30 minutes of, of 60 minutes about Chicago, done by BBC, was on the style of the person of Daily, Daily One. Okay, and Daily Two. Uh, I'll just and to continue that that uh, example. <coughs> I have said more than once, had the style, the, I, I, sh I shouldn't say the style, let me say the political culture and the conception of moralism, corruption, and public goods, in that sense he was the son of Harold Washington, the black mayor of Chicago, who followed his father and daily in turn followed Harold Washington. Harold Washington brought moralism and reform as a, as a rhetorical framework, a framing of Chicago, that after Harold Washington, you could not succeed the word Daily One. Daily One said, why'd you give the contract to son's insurance firm? He said, it's the father's duty to help his sons. Clientelism is legitimate for me and for, for our city. Okay, at that time, the, the Chicago Tribune and others were attacking, they disagreed, there was, there were, this was a battle, but at least that was his official statement the father's duty to help his sons. His own son said, any person who is caught will go to jail. That was Harold Washington's answer, which the son, in that answer, was showing that he was more of more son of Harold Washington than he was of his own father. Okay, so that, that's an example of how reform or transformations or how things that are being negotiated or demonstrated over in Hong Kong right now can be handled in ways when they're, when these things are continually changing. Okay. Um, so, and key leaders clearly make a difference. Now, in the strong view, that's all you need. Leadership defines policy. And some deterministic writers make this A, a deterministic story. In this course, we say, let's read some of that but also let's consider the option from Max Weber and many others of molding causality. There may be other things in addition to leadership that change policy, and we should think and talk about them as well. And the most, the most dramatic alternative in terms of moving away from one person is the idea of a market, the, uh, developed most by the neoclassical economists, and so markets are an alternative. That that if you if you say, for instance, as <coughs> uh, the mayor of San Francisco did, we want to help the homeless, and we will give them, and then not just in statements, but they gave homeless persons food, lodging, hotel rooms to stay in, um, a, a an emotional welcome for something under a year. And the number of homeless hugely increased as people from Utah, Nevada, Colorado got on a bus, sometimes assisted by a one-way ticket from people in that in Nevada. Say, well, why don't you go to San Francisco? They give you, they'll give you a lot more than you'll get here. And so after the flood of the homeless came to San Francisco, which we could say was this. That is, the policy of helping the homeless led to the shift in the market in the sense that the, I'll put in here, the social composition of citizens, and we've got B, C, social composition of citizens, in this example, the homeless. The homeless, the, per, the numbers and the percentage of homeless went way up, and that in turn fed back into the costs that the city was paying to support the homeless, which in turn changed the leadership and the policy. They said, we can't do this. That it, and so that is, this is, this is what economists have discussed, T-I-E-B-A, the city 
and Kibo, Kibo. Uh, <coughs> there's several other, and then and then specifically, this is integrated by Paul Peterson <coughs> and and others um, uh, who basically discuss <coughs> so-called bulking with your feet, or let's say the uh, the uh, the wheels of a Greyhound bus will take you from Nevada to San Francisco. So, so the effect is not just on San Francisco, it's on the town you left because they have one less homeless person. Okay, so in that sense, markets are driven by, and, and many people like Peterson have elaborated this, by the same that they try to analyze city governments and cities in the same way that people analyze private firms and private individuals in the private sector. That is with key concepts like competition, supply, demand, prices, clearing the market, uh, marketing, advertising. And competition is, is a key driver in shifting policies. Because if you get, if you, if you shift your policy toward the homeless, as San Francisco did, you may get problems which you did not anticipate, and that in turn may lead you to change, to change your policy uh, later on. So the competition, that is the competition between, uh, that is because San Francisco did not compete with the other places by limiting the homeless in their numbers and, and in their benefits, San Francisco paid more, if you will, went above the market price and that in turn led it to be uh, uh, the welcoming home of more homeless, but in turn, they felt it was too much of it, too expensive, therefore they moved back toward the market price. As illustrated, for instance, by Seattle, Portland, Argonne, who were, who were more, I mean, equally or more moralistically concerned with the homeless, and I had as a TA, a homeless organizer from Portland, Oregon, who does this now. He's a state leader in, in the state of Oregon. He has a PhD and a law degree from the University of Chicago. And he's, the, he's the number one homeless person in the U.S., <laughs> in, in one, of the, one of the nationally important people. <laughs> he, when he started, he met with the mayor of Portland and said, um, we want to help the homeless. And she said, and she said please, come in. Uh, come in with you and your friends, your homeless uh, others. Let's have, let's have a coffee together in my office and discuss what we could do to make Portland a more welcoming place for the homeless. He came to Chicago and they could not, he and the others could, would not be received, they would not be permitted to talk with Mayor Daly for years. So they started protesting outside his, outside his office, didn't work outside his home. Maybe two years later they had a meeting with us and he said, what do you want? You know, so it was a completely different kind of, kind, kind of situation between the two cities which illustrate the policy and then how these, how these feed back <coughs> and, and, and have changed over time. Okay, uh, so, uh, Sassen then, Sassen then uh, takes this globally, takes it globally and argues that the global competition between London and Tokyo and New York, uh, Beijing, etc. Transform, uh, and this is this is at the core of Brexit right now. I mean, the English are going right right through this right now. Do they want to follow the the in a sense the the European Union rules and apply those to England or not? That's the big big issue. And in, 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 in the way they see it, they're like San Francisco today. That is, they're dealing. I mean, do okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, globalization. We then have, have, have framed this that globalization cannot, can be framed not just as a cause, but also as an interacting thing. And so as we have more globalization, it may change the ways that um, these, other, these other processes work. Uh, and so this can be uh, A prime, B prime, C prime, et cetera. Um, uh, third section, political cultures, and I, I, I frame it most regularly with this, this little map, simplest way to summarize, Elazar, the 
three political cultures in New England, Middle Atlantic, and the South. Uh, and this is a moralistic kind of concern uh, that politics is a way of expressing the good life, the, the, the righteous person, the righteous set of values. It is part of religion. It's an extension of, of, of everything. And, and, and you have, you don't, you don't segregate your political self from your family self. Whereas by contrast, when Daly One was giving a talk, Daly Two was giving a talk here about his father, uh, he was asked at the end, did you learn about politics from your father when you were growing up at home? And his answer was never. We never talked about politics in my home because politics is dirty. So the segregation between politics and family was explicit in this, in this Middle Atlantic perspective. The South, by contrast, old families, hierarchy based initially on the slaves, and a, and a uh, sense a sense of respect, of deference, yes sir, yes ma'am, no sir, uh, and the like, legit showing a sense that you are, you the follower are accepting the legitimacy of at least bowing, holding the door open in ways that you would not if you were an egalitarian New Englander. <coughs> and then as we move to this globally, <coughs> <coughs> After 1968 with student disturbances, 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have these, these moralistic and many of these things through Amnesty International. We have global social movements that are transforming in a New England moralistic direction. Internal politics inside China, inside the Soviet Union in ways that these become global, national, as well as uh, local politics and so on. S uh, third section. Fourth section, urban innovation. Uh, Richard Florida crystallizes <coughs> um, the idea of innovation from especially James Jacobs, he cites as a major source of Jacobs. Uh, of, of um, his ideas, they drew on the 19th century Balzac and Baudelaire, the French novelist and poet, who talked about having a separate neighborhood where artists could live, could be more creative, unconstrained by <laughs> bourgeois lifestyle like marriage and, 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 and things, et cetera. Uh, and they could be more free and more innovative and creative, which you found then in the case study of Rich Lloyd on Wicker Park in Chicago and on, on the, the, uh, the uh, <coughs> uh, Warhol Economy book of Elizabeth Hurd in New York uh, with things moving in this direction like having clubs or social media. So even if you don't live in a separate neighborhood, you can communicate via social media now and achieve some of what Balzac was talking about in 1830, even if you live in a hierarchical family and your grandmother doesn't let you go out uh, after, and it has to be, you have to be back home by 8 p.m. Okay. Um, uh, urban innovation, Kentucky karaoke then, we, we discussed the, the kind of example of the grandmother as, as being a big, that is the strength of the family is an important factor and we introduced, um, we introduced a, sort of a one-page summary that you saw in, the, in these three books of, of these boxes of economic variables, governmental variables, social variables, and then cultural variables, and how these then converge on, on things like, so this, this was a couple of different things, the new political culture initially, and then scenes. Uh, and, and different things of this sort. But basically, these, are, these have been driven by changes in each of these boxes by globalization, competition, individualization, market, um, market um, related processes around, around the world. And these, these recur in different sections of the course, including the, um, the arts in a sense that, that um, 
Okay, let me let, let me stop here and I'll, I'll elaborate whatever whatever you find useful. Specifics. Yes. Which of the five uh, parts do you think is most just, important? Just a little bit louder. Which of the five parts do you think is most important? All are equally important. I would say it's better to have a feeling that is, it's better for you. I mean, just that is what my concern is that my concern in, in encouraging to take the exam is what you will have in your head, not just tomorrow or next week for the exam, but what you will have in your head 10 years from now. I get emails from students 10 and 20 years after they've been here saying, your course changed my life. Okay. If we can give you a framework that will help you do a better job, if you're a lawyer, if you're a homeless organizer, if you're a social media uh, web designer, if, you know, if you're working in advertising, if we can help you do that better, that's what we want to do. We don't want to help you pass the exam. We, yes, we want to help you pass the exam. But what's, what matters for you in the sense that will help you do better, whatever, whatever, whatever that is? And I would say, and so I'm looking to answer your question, I'm trying to say the names of people are not important. The, the idea that there's not, I'd say one big thing is multi-causality. And the one simple way that I put it is race, class, gender, and national origin explain about 10%. That most of life is not explained by what the media tells. Racism and capitalism are everything. <coughs> everything is, everything's 10%. That is no more than, than, than okay explain a little bit, but not everything. So I'd say that's a, that's a big takeaway, and it contradicts the media, it contradicts most of the social science courses that, 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 that you take. As you take a strong market course and people say, markets are everything. The state, the, the status people then may not realize it, they make tariffs too high, they're trying to destroy the market, but the market will come back. I mean, so you, you hear that at this university in, in some classroom. <laughs> but then, but other people may be, May, may use market concepts, but they won't. They won't try to be deterministic. So, in that sense, I'm proposing a multi-causal, probabilistic perspective, which you can find in, in all the social sciences and, and among reasonable humanists, novelists, artists, uh, mathematicians. <coughs> okay. Um, so, multi-causality. How to keep that is how you can take, but at the same time, you don't need to ignore deterministic arguments. Read a deterministic argument and say, how could I reframe that in a more relativist way that my boss, who I'm writing a memo for, would find useful? I, I, can, I spent a lot of time in my career consulting with mayors, especially. Mayors are, you know, they're openly political day and night, 365 days a year. And I've deliberately worked with many different political cultures and mayors. I worked with far left, far right. You know, I've gone to Yugoslavia under strong communism before, you know, under the Soviet Leninist style of communism to see how it worked. And then, and then, and then, <coughs> and then, and then, and then, and then worked with people. I worked in Africa when the, when they were the most radical left uh, group in in in, in the Seco Touré, head of head of Guinea in French West Africa. Uh, studied in France, studied in Germany. That is trying to, I did this because I wanted to see how different is it if we get away from the U.S. now. <coughs> and I'm continually working and learning from every week smart Chinese visitors. You're about 92, all right, roughly number 92. <coughs> and, and I learn about China week by week by week. Not because I go to China and live there all the time. I, I'm not a China specialist. But China today is a very important example for the entire world. But where and how to analyze and interpret changes within China, don't read the US media. You waste your time. OK. Uh, <coughs> so having the contrast, empirical contrast and differences, different countries, different kinds of cities, mayors, and so forth, is a great way to build a general theory, not just urban, national, global, international ways of thinking interpenetrate these specifics in ways that we should all recognize and use in what we do. I, I work with a group of 20 people in Chicago. We're, we're studying Chicago. That was one, one smart group. 
did a book on on uh, the the Cubs, the the Chicago Cubs um, north side area around the Cubs Stadium, and said how much is how much impact is it because there there are lots of bars, restaurants, and it's it's a booming nightlife on Friday and Saturday night and after the, after the games. <coughs> And so they did, they did a book and tried to say, how important is the impact of the Chicago Cubs on cities? And basically they studied a little bit of a neighborhood. And, and so I said, look, you're ignoring the impact on all the people who are coming from the suburbs of Chicago, all over the city who are going there, even if they have a drink in a bar there, the impact is important far beyond, including it goes to China, because the Chinese watch the Chicago Cubs. The Chinese bet on it. The Chinese advertise on the Chinese television when they're showing you the Chicago Cubs. That advertising revenue goes into the fee <coughs> that they pay the Chicago Cubs to have the rights to sell the television presentations in China. So if you ignore those fees, like because you're studying the neighborhood, you're doing a bad e evaluation. Okay, so that. That sensitivity to when you're in a situation like that, if you're, whether you're, if you're opening a bar and you're trying to advise the Chicago Cubs, don't just think about what you can see out the window. Remember China. Um, so so I'm, I'm ticking off a couple of big lessons that I've, 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 I've tried to make, which we'll continue with, but which, you, which, you're, which you're linked with these bigger that is, I'm giving you bigger but pretty simple frameworks that you can use and adapt. And um, and what, what we've then done, as you've seen before, is put a box around this to make, to make more explicit that we can have system characteristics and then call this, say, one city or one nation. And then say, how, do they, how and why do a and B and C change if we're in a more egalitarian society, in a national society which stresses human rights, like Scandinavia and the U.S. And China has a uh, China. The Chinese will say we have a different, better conception of human rights, which is more economically informed, which includes more the economy, rather than you Westerners, where you ignore your poor people. Okay. More questions. Hands up over there before. <coughs> yes. So two, two hands, but go ahead. Go first. Um, you talked about. Yeah, just to get to know, start to get to know you. Why don't you tell us your, your name and your name. Your, your, what's your name? Where are you from? Jack Goodkin, Westchester County, New York. Westchester County, New York. Okay. Nick, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Milwaukee, great. Uh, so you were talking about in the urban innovation section about amenities and the economic. Um, like foundation about utility maximization, is the innovation is it like is the concept of urban innovation related to the rise of like is or I mean not related but is it directly referring to the rise of artistic and like type of good looking anything we were talking about more previously, or is it more about economic de like and technological development? Uh, both. That that is the the in if we say if if we say that urban innovation, if we take Jane Jacobs's answer to your question and take her life and death of great American cities, her answer would be, we want more economic development, and the, but that the key the key driver of critical economic development is, and she would say, following Schumpeter is new ideas, new products, cell phones, television, radio, etc. They may be technological, they may be other kinds of innovations such as having a new kind of bar in Detroit where you have paintings on the, in the alleyway. Okay, but, those, those, but that, in that sense, that's an economic development. But the question is, where and why do you get this? And her answer was cities, that cities do more of this. And why and how do they do it? And her answer was, put it in here, the way that makes sense, that the, <coughs> well, we could have a, um, Yeah, so, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't do this right. <laughs> I made a mistake. I, I meant to put leadership over here and then so, social characteristics over here. So put, this, this should be, move this in your notes over here a little bit. So in an intermediary position, 
we can have either arts activities, artists, uh, art institutions, art neighborhoods, um, and she made the argument uh, following Balzac that we can be more free in our neighborhood, and she heard, and she, half of her book is on, half of it, a lot of the book is on Greenwich Village. Now, Greenwich Village in New York City really illustrated this and how it was where artists lived, but it, but it didn't matter from her standpoint that you were selling your paintings, it mattered that you were bohemian, that you, that you had the lifestyle of a bohemian, which was seen in Balzac's terms as, as synonymous with, with artists. Okay, so the, the simple answer to your question is both artists and the Schumpeterian, or, uh, Schumpeterian idea of innovation combined to generate economic development that's measured as a component of the GNP. Uh, yeah, yeah, just behind you. I was wondering if you yeah, but, yeah, yeah, name Alex, and where you're from. I'm Alex, I'm from Sweden. Okay. I was wondering if you could repeat the last point you said um, when you gave us the recap, like the books is to the top. Uh, uh, the, the recap for yeah. which one? That one. I wanted this one here? Yeah. This is economic, um, social, and cultural boxes government boxes, and these, I gave you this, I think, three times, linked with the new political culture ideas, and then second with Ken Tuckville karaoke, and then third with um, scenes, the scenes book. So those three books, which I've written with, with others, with other co collaborators, basically show how slightly different variations of these work, all giving you the same basic message, but but, but the more general point is within each of those boxes, like I have S here for, for social, we had, we had specific things like more highly educated uh, citizens, women who have more egalitarian gender roles, mothers who work outside the family, those specific components are, are going on in ways that we can we can see how they can have their own little dynamics and processes within a fa within <coughs> one, within the say within the Chinese or the Asian family, within the Swedish family, and then we can measure and conceptualize the differences. So I talked about how in the case of Sweden, the Swed maybe you weren't here that day when the the Swedish welfare state was destroyed by egalitarianism applied to women, but to put it strongly, that Swedish women wanted to be able to have be able to work when they wanted, but they did not want to have to work full time in Volvo. And therefore the pay of a wall Volvo worker would differ if you had a family with a mother at home and four children, which had to be that amount to support you. But if you have the mother and the four children are all are all working and then they all say they all want to be paid the same as the father who's working and okay. So in that sense that that differentiation of references destroyed the, the, the Swedish welfare state. I mean, it's a, 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 cr a crude example of how, <coughs> whereas by contrast, stronger families in Asia maintain more social traditions longer, but in the last 10 years, they're changing very fast in Asia right now. I talked especially about the example of gays, gays in, gays in Korea six years, about six or seven years ago, Richard Florin and I were at a conference with the mayor of Seoul, and we, we asked afterward, you know, how are gays treated in, in, in Korea? And, and the, the, the famous example was, there was a, uh, a, ho a talk show host who came out uh, and he was, he was fired. He could not get a job for a couple of years. He committed suicide. I, I, I told that story in a, in, a, in a classroom like this, and two Chinese students came up to me and said, you know, in today in China, there's all kinds of sort of gossip discussion going on about how this or that baseball star or talk show host or political leader is gay, and everybody knows it now. But that, and that has become, you know, social media discussion content, even in China, whereas, it was not only a few years ago. Okay, so, the, so these things, 
these things are happening and these things are, let's say, I, I won't say destroy, I say weakening, potentially slimming, slimming the functions the family performs. But, but there are big differences within China, within, within, within the US. And, but it's not, these are not a yes or a no, they're variable. So we can measure how strong is the family, what are the gender roles of the mother, the wife, the family, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then capture the differences between the American South and the North, uh, between divorced persons or persons never married, et cetera. Et cetera. And the, the, these all matter. Okay. Who else? Someone else had a question. So, so is, is that is that enough of an elaboration or? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any, so that basically the sh the little letters are a big box. And we can talk about as many of these details like the Swedish family and the Chinese family as, and gays as an indicator as, as we want. And then ideally draw on research, not by me, but by people who are specialists on families in, in Sweden. That, and that, just for others, that's how the economists build the GNP models. The economists have, have about a thousand variables that go into a model of how does the GNP work, but they're not a single data source. They use a whole lot of different, you know, hundreds of different studies of families, of websites, website, website uh, corporations, of uh, taxation, and they'll put these in, in these little boxes and, they put, and then they put in numbers based on a study of one thing and then they'll say, okay, the average result in three studies of website designers is that this should be, uh, you know, this path should be 0.39. So we use 0.39 as an estimate of that path for the national average for estimating how the GNP works. Okay, so, so basically we can do the same thing and, and we, don't need, we don't need to have as much serious research to think, to think, to see that the world may be working like that the way that the GMP works, as modeled by GMP modeling e economists. The G put just in terms of history, in the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes wrote about the GNP, and economists in the 1930s, they didn't draw arrows like this, they didn't use equations, they wrote like Balzac. They were literary. Uh, it was Simon Kuznets, uh, who was, <coughs> when I was teaching in Harvard, I, li I lived right, right next door to Simon Kuznets. And, and he, he was the man who built the, the first quantitative measures of the GNP in the world. Okay, so the measure measurement of this is hard, hard, but you can use the concept for 100 years before you get these numbers. See, we can do ethnographic field work, we can do Literary, literary work is, is our empirical source, but we can still think in, in, in these terms. We're talking this some of the time. Just as we can in, try to introduce literary concepts, aesthetics that come from and sharpen our ability to talk about styles of consumption. Uh, shocking, uh, transgressive, traditional, that these, these are the 15 kinds of scenes dimensions which are in people's heads, and they may sharpen them by reading uh, the magazine called Seventeen, or Women's Wear Daily, or Vogue, and they say, hey, I want to get a dress like that because that makes me look more, huh, and, and, and differs by different suburban towns outside Chicago, from Wheaton to Glen Ellen to Hinsdale, <laughs> and they have different styles of dresses, and so forth. Okay. You have a question almost. No, it's not. Oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> what's what's on your mind as you're thinking that thought? I'm thinking if, about if you had if you had a thought if you had a question, what would it be? Well, I'm thinking about the, the applications of this course back in my hometown in Brazil, in Rio. Excellent. And how like the things that we're learning can to describe the situation. Excellent. Yeah, maybe give us an example of something you're trying but maybe having trouble with. You know, one curious urban policy that happened in Rio back during the Olympics in 2016 
was when, when Chicago was, lost and re- and re- they did. <laughs> the Rio one. There okay. was the Olympic City was built, and they moved a whole favela, a whole slum with about fifty thousand people to a whole different neighborhood, a whole different area, fifty kilometers away, just to build the Olympic Village. And I don't, I don't understand how the forces didn't guide so that decisions like that don't happen because it affects thousands of people. Yeah. I live in my apartment looking down on what was to be the Chicago Olympic Village and which did not come to Chicago. So Chicago is preparing for it to, to competing with Rio and the others. We tore down a whole hospital and, it, and it's been torn down in mud ever since for over 10 years. So I'm on a committee with the, with the aldermen. We're trying to work out things to, to replace what was there. But, but that, that is, the imp- there, there's a globalization competition impact, which is, I'm still looking at, and Rio, Rio is part of that. So, so within Rio, and, and we've had, I've had, at, in those years, I've had a couple of people who were PhD students in Rio uh, who, we, who we had in some of our sessions via Skype. So we talked about this and related issues in Rio several times. The, the other big thing is, which I would say, which is a, more important in Rio, and I, I partially mentioned this before, <coughs> is the Spanish af, in, the, in the Middle Ages, in a strong Christian manner, you had separate neighborhoods in Spain and Italy where the neighborhoods within within Rome, within within Madrid and so forth, within small towns, you'd have little neighborhoods, and they would have in holy week, they would have floats that they would build and present and compete with each other. Who could build the best float to celebrate the Virgin Mary or God and Jesus and so forth? And then <coughs> this continues today in Holy Week parades in Spain. In a in a in a sophisticated, elegant manner with, with music, with with drums and, and horns and etc. costumes. But the best known, certainly maybe in the world, is is is, is one of the most best known is Rio. So you you have you have the Mardi Gras celebration. But the Mardi Gras celebration is part of more generally what we're working on a book on right now, which we call Latin Scenes. That is, these, these started with Holy Week, but then they get to Hong Kong going on right now. That is the street demonstrations, the fighting, the battles with the police, and in between Hong Kong today, what was there in the video that we showed about one or two sessions back? Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street. So the Occupy movement, which was in the video went to something that was, was picked up by 115 cities simultaneous and soon afterward, they started doing the same kinds of Occupy demonstrations, which was Latin politics in the 19th, 20th century in ways that this was considered immoral, irresponsible, violence by the northern Europeans, especially the English. So, and, Ameri- and, and let's say at least the moralistic Americans said no violence. You know, we must talk and we must build a consensual, moralistic, acceptable solution. And so if you have that, so in a sense today, you have a lot, you know, that is you have massive demonstrations in Rio inspired by Mardi Gras, inspired by the idea that you're in the streets, that there are thousands of people in the streets and that's a normal part of politics. Maybe maybe police beating you up, fighting with the police, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in ways that um, this, this has spread. And so it came from Spain, but my point is this is now being done in England, in the US, in Australia, and even China. So it, there was an earlier Chinese tradition, but more recently, the, the, this Occupy Paris in 1968, uh, that, I mean, especially the, year, the Southern European cities had a lot of this, but this has now been so much in social media and television and so forth that everybody's doing it. How, what's the difference in New Orleans? Anybody from New Orleans? Or ever, any, anybody been to the New Orleans Mardi Gras? How's it different from, from Rio? 
diff one big difference is there are people in New Orleans holding up signs. You are sinners. Go home. Do not, do not engage in this in, the, in these immoral activities which you participate in now. That is, there, there are people who fly in and who live, and who, and who live nearby who are saying, this, this is sinful, wrong, etc. The, the more sensual side of the, of, the, of, the, of the Mardi Gras. Whereas in Rio, you don't have that. So the context of Puritanism, moralism, transforms potentially the strength of the A, that you may have well, that is, you may have fewer people going there from from uh, Glen Ellen High School or Wheaton. I, I, I doubt if there are many who go from Wheaton College to Mardi Gras. If, if we go from Wheaton, no, no, there we go. We have a box. It's a, it's a, we have a box in the Cities and Entertainment Machine. Take a look of women, women who were sort of, let's say, Wheaton College type people who went to. Uh, St. Louis, I'm trying to remember what it was, St. Louis strip clubs, and they would talk with the strippers and say, we're not here to condemn what you're doing. We want to help you in your lives become better people. And it went through a whole story on how there are uh, caring, evangelical, um, uh, moralistic Protestants who do that in ways that would transform, if you had this going on in Rio, it would transform everybody. Who knows how, but uh, my, my point is, these, these historic backgrounds, which you can see then in adjacent suburbs in Chicago today, making a difference in people's lives. Remember, no drinking, no dancing. If, you, if you're gonna rent an apartment and you wanna drink and dance, be careful, don't go to weed. Okay, so does that mean, is that a beginning of an answer? So that is, think of Latin scenes, think of street activities, parades, politics, <coughs> demonstrations, marches, protests, and how much difference those made, and then how much those, those were also criticized in the Trump primary. 2016, when Trump beat Hillary Clinton, the media continually were attacking Trump and showing these people in, who were Trump supporters are using violence or they're causing other people to use violence and the number of shootings, the number of anti-Muslim activities, the, the attacks on, on synagogues has gone up since Trump because of that kind of, so, so that kind of thing, at least in moralistic America, is being blamed on, in a sense, the penetration of street, street stuff. So, so I would say start with a Rio, a Brazil, and then look for the more general concepts which you can find gener to generalize from and then say how might these be a little different in some neighborhoods within Rio where you have more of this, more of this and more less of that. We have a PhD student here who's um, Japanese and ethnic background, but she's Brazilian. She grew up in Brazil. She studied there. She speaks Brazilian, et cetera, <coughs> Portuguese. Uh, but, but she never went to a Mardi Gras because that was seen as immoral within her family. Okay, so even within Rio, you have, and, and the Japanese are a significant, and Asians more generally, an important element, and the immigrants from the 19th century onward made Rio become very, there's a book by Marty Lipset and Sol, Soltani, comparing all the different uh, Latin American countries. <laughs> and basically, Colombia is the most, is the most traditional Spanish hierarchical, uh, conquistador families are known in their hacienda backgrounds and the like. Mexico and Puerto Rico are the closest to the U.S. and to Western Europe. In between are Brazil, Argentina, which were highly successful economically in the cities because, not because they, they didn't have the Spanish background, but because they had immigrants like these Koreans and earlier in the 19th century, Greeks, Italians, um, uh, and others who brought entrepreneurial uh, styles of, of building uh, finance, uh, economics in, 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 those, in those countries, and these, these, these persist today. Okay. They had, survey, they had surveys of university students in each of those countries and said, what do you want to do for a career? And the, the Columbia said, you know, I want to be a plantation owner. I don't really want to work. I want to 
you know, I want to be a gentleman, I want to go horseback riding, and etc. Whereas in, in uh, okay, the, the other extreme, say Mexico is, is the closest to the U.S. and look at all the amount of migration back and forth in Mexico. Yes, yes sir. Uh, could, you, could you talk a little bit more about the reasons again? The, the reasons? The regions. Such uh, regions over here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I talk more about the South because you've heard generally less about the South. I, I, I admit there's less than okay. But if we talk, say, about, um, I gave you the quintessential example of New England moralism is the Quaker church. And most of you may not be Quakers, but the idea is you sit in a Quaker meeting. You may have 50 people there. There is no sermon. There is no minister. You wait until you are moved, and then someone will say, you know, I saw something on television yesterday, and I thought it was deplorable. It was, what should we, what should we do about it? And then someone else may say, I saw the same thing, and I agree with you. Someone else may say, I saw it as well, but I think it's outside. And so they have a discussion, and they try to end with a sense of consensus among themselves because they share egalitarianism uh, in terms of many values, but also especially the rules of the game. Instead of following Rob, they don't follow Robert's rules of order or the US Congress. They, they, they try to compromise so they can build not, not a majority of 50% plus one and then vote. They don't vote. They talk until they try to find a consensus. By changing the policy output, this way with a feedback to make everyone be closer in agreement. And at the University of Chicago, at least the style among many of the departments and faculty meetings is to try to build a Quaker consensus. So we try to we try in that sense to be collegial. Not to say, you know, I'm, I'm more senior than you or we have more votes than you, but to try to have everybody talk and build a consensus so that they, because we're going to live together for a long time. Okay. Uh, yes. Talk a little bit about like, what the structure will be in the midterm. Like, what, what the, the stru structure is in, like what to expect. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me let me let's go right to that, and then we 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 because we can elaborate this if, if, if we want. Uh, we'll have we'll have some identification questions, maybe four or five of those. Let's say maybe maybe six or eight of those, and you have to answer maybe four. For instance, short shorter IDs, but I would okay. Uh, maybe one word, two or three words. Uh, globalization, for instance. Uh, <coughs> then an essay section, which might count, say, six, maybe 60% six, of the grade, uh, and we'll have either, we'll have something where you can write an essay in your, well, your, in your own words. So I'm not focusing so much on the specific type of question, but the, the big point I, I'm making is use the whole time. Use Put down as many ideas and many specifics as you can. Don't say I'm done and then send in the exam 20 minutes early. Keep on adding more because the level and amount and the subtlety of the ideas will is, is that is the what that is put differently. There's not a right or a wrong easy answer. Yes, no. But, and that's that's the big the big point I'm making in all of this. Most of this stuff is not is is more is complicated. And if you can show us how much you have recognized and begun to systematize that idea that life is complicated, but instead of just saying complicated, how specifically can you use some of the ideas from this course and use them to a new area that you may know something about, such as Rio or Sweden, and then take a, re a Rio or even a Swedish example and write, write that as, that potentially could be in, a, in, in, in the essay, for instance. So, so sh that is, what we're looking for is not words or a name. We're looking for your clear, coherent, insightful analysis in the way you, an in the way you answer the question. But I mean, if you, if you get the completely wrong name, you don't know any names, that, that doesn't help. <laughs> any, any, any more on that, sort of on sort of Criteria, I mean, and I, I don't think what I've said is probably any different than probably many of the courses here. So, and but anything else on exam specifics? Yes. Um, so there's a dog on camera. 
canvas. The little ladder? Uh, there's a doc on canvas, terms for review session. Uh, so uh, is a what on canvas? There's a document on canvas. A document? Yeah, uh, that says terms for Oh, okay, for oh, on the session. campus website. I thought I was thinking, okay. Yeah, the canvas, yeah. yeah so, okay. like, are those terms the ones we can expect to see on the midterm, or they're not all? The, yes, the, those mean, what, the, that there's a list which is there, which is basically taken from the syllabus. It's a combination of what's in the syllabus and just looking at some of the chapters. So we may or may not send that out, but I would say you should you should be able to do all of that yourself from your own knowledge, just for example. Might those be on the exam? Yes, they might be. They, 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 <coughs> maybe we take something like that. I mentioned globalization. That is, it's not as if that's a, that because because I'm not I'm not saying 100% it will be on the exam. I'm saying we might use it. That that is. We're not trying to trick you. We're not trying to, to, to say, you know, there's a right or a wrong, you gotta get the right. The, the idea is for you to show how you can clearly <coughs> and logically and coherently write about the kinds of things we've been, we've been discussing here. Yes? All right, no, is your, your hand up again? No. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we, we can come back to regions if, if um, no one else has a, has a different question or, or that is, <laughs> right. any, any more, anything else? Yeah. And then, of course, because we had people coughing and and problems of logistics, or people saying, well, "I've got, I got to," you know, I'm on the, I'm on the uh, football team. We got We got to work out in, in California. Uh, and and can I have a different exam? No, you can just take the exam in California in your hotel room. Okay. So, so you can. You, it will be at class time, but you can be in California in your hotel room. Uh, and you can take the exam. It will be sent out at 4.30. A couple of people have come in with, with, uh, with things like disability <coughs> and, and non-English speaking natives. They get, they get extra time as a as a group. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe put in, put, maybe write in your exam your name and then say, you know, I get, I get, I forget, what was it, is it 20 minutes, 30 minutes? Do you remember? It's time and a uh, quarter. So I can't. It's time and a quarter for the accommodation. That, that's for that's for disability. Mm -hmm. No, no, but for non-English speaking persons, I think it's in the syllabus, but I've just forgotten that off from the top. Yeah, of I can't see it. I, I think it's. I think you get 20 minutes. 20 minutes extra. So so read that if you're not. But tell us you're non-English speaking native, and then and and the, you know and the, and then we'll have the timestamp when your exam comes back. Then we'll know it. Just, and then and get it back. You know, one minute before before that or say two minutes, whatever, so it's like it's stamped by the, and, and on time within, within that way. More questions, big or small? Yes? Is the exam going to show up on Canvas? Uh, no, it should be sent, sent uh, well, no, we, we could, I mean, if, uh, if you, I mean, we, we could, but uh, it, um, at this point, we're planning simply to send it as an email to everyone who is registered for the course. Okay, and then just to email the response, your answers back. Yeah. So, so we yeah we haven't we don't yet have a written thing, and and uh, Rishi Arar is, is ill today, so he's he's not here. But but the three of us will will get a draft, and we will probably say please send back your email to the three of us: to Terry Clark, Tim Elder, and Rishi Arar. All three. Who else? Can you talk a little about how the Elazar regions? So, does it impact each one of these individually, or is it its own box that like applies to them? Yeah, excellent question. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I mean, uh, uh, the quick answer is both. That is, if you can have values over here, like egalitarianism is stronger or weaker. Or, or let's say we, that is, it may have a bigger ABC. So this, this is a E for egalitarianism. This this E coefficient may be bigger or stronger depending on the region. So in New England, with my with my Quaker example, egalitarianism was very strong 200 years ago. The new and the reason this is not just a little U.S. region is that this is now affecting the negotiations between China and the U.S. over tariffs. The 
Trump is talking, Trump is talking about a lot of stuff. We don't know how he balances, but at least according to the Western media and Trump's, Trump's Twitter and kind of stuff, he's talking about everything. He's talking about Hong Kong, he's talking about human rights, he's talking about egalitarianism, he's talking about protests, he's talking about women. All these things are building in to trade negotiations. And the same thing in Ukraine. You know? uh, so in that sense, <coughs> uh, and Trump, Trump, Trump may not care, that, let me make that explicit, he personally may not, quote, believe in, or his heart of hearts, you know, who knows where Trump's heart of hearts is, or anybody else's. But the, the question is, does this affect what he says in the tweets? And does this affect the discussion of the negotiations? And I would, and, and, and what, this can, what, what this framing can, sh can show you is that even in a middle Atlantic Trump example, it was a, a Wall Street, um, dealer in that sense, he can refer to uh, human rights in, negotiation, in negotiations with Chinese over the main topic is tariffs, but he can invoke these other things because he feels that these are, that the Chinese partially share this within some, that is their concern about corruption, <coughs> corruption is a big visible domestic issue inside China. So he's trying to link with that at the same time <coughs> that he that he wants to use it as a leverage, but he, he but how much he does it depends would shift within his and with with his assessment of how much the American and the other media are doing things and, and how they're covering what what he said, and so <coughs> so you know all, I mean always another reason that this kind of thing is complicated is is, is he's saying it in on one in in, in so called to the Chinese, but how much is international policy really domestic policy? How much is he doing this really that he wants to say, I'm tough and I campaign on, we don't want those immigrants taking our jobs. And he's following up on that slogan to saying, we're making America great again. So that I mean, that's what he's really doing. So the, the, uh, the cover of The Economist magazine this week shows him holding his red cap in the, in the air, carrying some golf clubs, climbing, climbing onto a big U.S. Air Force jet, and the, but the, the heading is, how much can we trust America under Trump, basically? And he's destroyed the trust that many have had because of his treatment of the Kurds. So in that sense, even if he doesn't care about the Kurds, and even if he doesn't care about trust, other people are punishing Trump and the Americans, because Trump has treated the, Tur the Kurds in ways that the U.S. again we don't know where their hearts are, hearts of hearts are, but the U.S. Congress says Trump. I'm a Republican, maybe in this example, a Republican senators in Congress are saying Trump, you are acting stupidly, immorally, irresponsibly by abandoning <coughs> the Kurds who, who, who killed them, you know, who gave their lives. Because and, um, and saving American lives in the process, and you're ignoring that. Okay. So in that in that sense, these these things. And so, how important is that? Probably in Scandinavia, it matters more than in um, Brazil. But I, I don't know. Okay. Other other folks who want to, but and, but. Your your question is good, and it brought and it, it forced me to bring out that the the, the answer that, that the impact can be, and this and this this point I mean the, the question and the answer also holds in the scenes analysis. So so in a sense, this kind of box, this kind of box we're modeling, I'm using in in the presentations. I'm I'm, so I'm applying it to the whole course, but you can see it as I've said more explicitly developed in three books in ways that are especially important in scenescapes where we don't just have we don't just have values in an abstract one word, we have fifteen specific dimensions. And the point is there is that there are fifteen different ways of being right, wrong, moral, immoral, good, bad, and and, and so forth. Fifteen like localism, transgression, uh, utilitarianism, etc. Yes? Could you give us an example of Nice question that you could 
give of the test is so we assume that they have given in the past years. Uh, we, could, we could have a quote from The Economist such as I just gave you. Comment on this front page image of Trump and the meaning of the red cap. <laughs> Maybe I won't say I won't say that, but I mean, we could we could just give you that image. Write an essay commenting on this front page image, and I give you the begin the, the, some core points of it as a possible answer in in discussing how the Congress the Congress has voted to disagree with Trump. Um, in that but the Economist used to be a market-oriented Manchester liberal magazine, but it's, it's become much more openly political and critical of many indi individual leaders. So they often have individual leaders <laughs> like Trump, and they attack the leader and what he's done uh, explicitly. So what's economics is um, interpenetrated by these other things, or is, is recognized today more We have a we have a, a new visitor from from China. Do you want to briefly introduce yourself and just say what what your what your sir how, how you're here today? <laughs> yeah, 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 it's fine. You either sit or just stand, whatever. Hello, I'm a new visitor from China, and my main interest is about the city competition, the competition between cities, and maybe I do some some info work on the competition with for the for the labor between the Chinese. He's been working with George Tully, and I'm, I'm co-authoring a paper with George Tully, who was one of the first economists who developed the, the analysis of amenities, and where we, we, we take, <coughs> and we've been working now more recently on, that is, how to, how to, measure, how to measure some of these things. And, one, and so when we say policy, that's, that's the government policy, like, uh, and I'll just put it in a, a, a little box here. <laughs> um, um, can either have a separate box or build it in with others. But we can we can have we can have prices of land or homes or rent or an Airbnb room rental price. We have we now have 180,000 Airbnb room prices in the 12 largest U.S. cities. And we're analyzing those data to say how much are room prices affected by all these other things. And so we're me we're trying to measure these. And in, and this basically means this is how the economists started to do this with George Tully about 30 to 40 years ago. That is, they they George and others worked on clean air and January <coughs> temperatures, two big obvious factors which may have led people to leave Chicago and New York, especially when they retire and move to Florida or New Mexico. So people said, how much does January temperature move or increase the price of a rent or of land in Florida and, and uh, Santa Fe? <coughs> and how much can we measure that and relate that to January temperature when we control everything else, <coughs> income, education, occupation, crime rates, and so forth and so forth. And that was called hedonic price analysis. And, and the, the idea is to measure the strength of that causal arrow. Uh, but that is, if you, so here we, we have data on prices, but we want to measure things like values. <coughs> How do you measure values? If you, especially if you don't, that is, you can't, that, that is, you can do survey research, the normal survey research of a, of a, is of a national sample of 1,500 citizens. No more. What does that tell you about Berkeley versus Waco, Texas? Zero. So if you want, about, you want to know about Berkeley versus Waco, Texas, you've got to use something else. So one thing is to look at the prices of land in Berkeley and Waco and every other zip code in the U.S., 45,000 of them, and then to try to look at the values that we have if we have, if we have some other kinds of things like the number of tattoo parlors, the number of strip clubs, the number of um, guns, so the number of gun clubs. Uh, yeah, I have someone monitoring some of this who, who, who showing 
that in Chicago grocery stores are filled with, you can take some photographs, are filled with gun club, gun magazines and opioid, uh, you know, um, drug magazines. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a normal standard grocery store, there were four gun magazines and five magazines about drugs this week. Okay, I, I didn't know that. But, so, but I'm saying you can start to get data like that, say on the, um, and so you can, get, we, so we've downloaded, in the last 15 years, we've been, we've been looking for interesting data, ex especially extreme things like downloading Christian rock concerts, in, such as in Wheaton. So you can have a rock concert, but it's gotta be a Christian rock concert. Then you can get a measure of the number of Christian rock concerts in Wheaton and then to other places in the whole U.S. And in that way, you can measure the degree of Christian rock support and then the meaning of that within an evangelical Protestant context, which you, you may have more comment on, on, on it than, than well, no, that may, maybe we don't have time right now, but, but it'd, be, it'd be a great paper topic to try to say, you know, how can one capture the differences in political culture in those three towns using some interesting indicators like the, one, the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, the uh, okay, um, well, and then Florida famously used gays. He tried, and so he, he just got the number of, of men living together. He didn't have, he didn't know anything about specific sexual activity. He simply took from the census the number of men living together, and at the beginning they called those gays. And it's stupid because there are lots of, of almost it's stupid, but it, it, it has measurement error included in it because the many men who lived together were, were not gay. But the point is, if you don't have data at a, in, a, in a way that you try to, uh, that's where you want, you can try to do something else, or you can try to do an ethnography and talk to some people. But then, if you do it just in one place, you don't know how much, it, how much you generalize. So the idea is to try to find ways of, you know, talking to people, doing a, a, a critical ethnic experiment or a critical ethnographically well-selected site, such as Wheaton, Glen Allen and, and Hinsdale, where you've got three very different locations which may illuminate bigger processes going on around the world. Okay. More, so you, did, did you start, yeah, let's see. Did, I, I think you started to say you had, you had more questions than, than we answered. I find one right now, I was wondering, um, what's the difference between prices and markets? Because would it prices be like incorporated on the markets? Uh, good point. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I'm using market here more, and I, 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 I didn't do it. I should have put it in the middle. Uh, so I, I should really put, put um, the only, we have policy output, policy outputs over here. You should have leader, leadership and um, uh, organized activities, that, that is the idea is that these are political processes or decisions, not just political, but civic activities, things about how things are done. And then back here we have more basic underlying characteristics like community characteristics, population size, income, ethnicity, crime, poverty. Uh, and, and so over here I, I put values of citizens, but we can then put markets in a sense in the middle, but in a sense that, that citizen values can be processed through a market. So in that sense, a market is better in an intermediary position. But how do we know how a market is working? Uh, a price is a, I put it in a different box because this is usually a public policy. If it's called policy, it usually, it, it usually involves it's either the government specifically or the government actively linked with it, whereas prices of an Airbnb are much less government uh, defined in that, or directed in, in, that, in that sense. So the idea of hedonic price analysis is that we can look at the impacts of values, we can try to guess, guesstimate values through the market process and as measured by the hedonic uh, price, price level of price and the analysis of this in the context of a bigger model where all these other things are, are, are controlled. 
or try to think, um, or, you know, having, or have say having three adjacent suburbs where we may control relatively income, education, occupation, crime, and so forth. They, I'm assuming, I'm, I shouldn't say I'm assuming, I'm, I'm wondering, we could, and, we, and that, and that as, I, as I said, what we try to do in this course explicitly is, is go beyond the necessity for assumptions and look instead for how these things may vary from local neighborhood or town to, to the next. And that way we can say how important is crime or poverty or uh, religiosity or the number of Catholic churches in affecting these, these other things. Follow up on uh, any of that? No. Okay. Uh, anything else? That, yeah. Like how would you analyze the trade tariffs? Like what do you need examples of class? Yeah, the, the, I, I mean, the, the quick answer is the one that I, I did of, of China and Trump now, <coughs> of saying that, that there may be a narrow discussion of, uh, you know, we'll give you a lower tariff on um, importing um, toys for Christmas and televisions which Americans may want to buy for Christmas. Or something, something like 60% of retail sales are for Christmas gifts and so forth. Right, so right now this is the game. So the Americans want to have low, have, be able to have, Trump doesn't want to see himself as, as making it expensive that you can't have a television. Chinese want to sell the television to the American market, so Trump will, can negotiate reducing from 25 to 20 to 15 percent that tariff. The Chinese have then have then said, okay, we'll let you import more American agricultural goods if we, if you reduce the tariff on televisions which we'll sell you in the U.S. So that, that's the narrow tariff discussion. The broader tariff discussion is how human rights may come in, as, as illustrated, for example, by by how how Hong Kong is treated by the by the Chinese police. Okay, and like, what would you be able to use the Alizar um, not to analyze that in any way? Moralism is being traded off against prices, and, the, and the, this is the, think me in simplistic terms. This is Wall Street. This is moralism. Yeah. Or uh, Trump, what's, what's the title of Trump's book? I mean, his, his book has that, it's not his term, but he uses it in the title of his book. It's the, um, uh, somebody, somebody look, look it up or not. Art of the Deal. The what? The Art of the Deal. Yeah, The Art of the Deal, there we go. Okay, the, the, the deal, I mean, the, 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 the concept of a deal is, um, that <coughs> assumes that that you can ignore everything before and after the deal. That you come into the negotiation table and you only talk about stuff that's on the table. And so that that concept you have in some of the big investment banks in New York. I mean, they, they really act in those terms, and they compete with other banks, such as from <coughs> Seattle or sometimes Boston, where people will say, we, we are a bank and we want to have trust and we want to build, we have an organizational culture that is trusting and we're building long term. And we don't just want to focus on one deal. Okay. So within, or within banks, within on negotiation tables, these things, these things can also play a role, but where and how much varies. And, and people from the, from the narrower Wall Street background will say, the art of the deal only concludes what we have on the table now, uh, but, but, okay. So. Okay, so maybe New England would be more upset about tariff, and they're gonna think about it the way with like morals, and, uh, like, oh, it's unfair what happens to people, whereas on Wall Street, they're gonna focus more on how it's gonna affect the economy. Yes, in, 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 in simple terms, yes. Okay, we are at the end of the hour. Uh, yeah, uh, I think did did uh, Rishi or Tim? Uh, did Rishi send out, is having office hours on Friday. If you have anything else there, you can email email or talk with him. And the exams will have to come on Monday.